Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Saturday, March 4th edition of VR News. Going to do a bit of a game developers conference wrap up in a couple minutes. But I want to start with a company called Tactical Haptics. Now, these guys were also at last week's game developer conference. They had a booth and they were showing off their haptic feedback device that they're calling the Reactive Grip Controller. Now, ultimately, they are striving to make this compatible with a lot of peripherals slash controllers outside even VR. So it will include VR. That's where we're going to keep our focus, but they're hoping for a wider market. Now, what they feel sets them apart is the way they're approaching haptic. Rather than just being the rumble and shake effect that we've gotten used to with a lot of devices, including like the Striker VR we talked about last night, what they're doing is using little crayon sized rubber cylinders and their movement to create a fairly unique haptic effect. Now this thing looks almost like a squared horseshoe and on the front of it you can append stuff like a Vive Tracker for example for full tracking but you basically grip the shaft portion. So you grip your shaft tight and picture like I said, rubber coated crayon sized cylinders, one front, one back, one left, one right. Those cylinders can move independently or in unison. Picture swinging a one handed flail, which is an old medieval weapon. You've got uh, your wooden shaft, chain, ball, perhaps even spikes on it. Well, when you're swinging back like this and the ball and gravity is tugging it this way, they could move the cylinder that's in your palm and create that effect. Likewise, they could have all cylinders move in a direction, recess, reset, move again to create the feeling of continuous movement. Maybe a weapon slipping through your grasp, for example. So I just thought that was a very innovative approach to haptics. Check that out in the link below. Next story. Cloud-based development program called Spatial OS has hit beta within the last couple of days. What they're offering is a cloud-based, basically they're offering resources, the ability to control an almost infinite amount of video game worlds. So really, they're catering to things like MMOs that require not just processing horsepower uh, and a lot of it, but the ability to scale and scale large. They have been working with companies like Unreal, the Unreal Engine, and come up with some pretty cool hybrid stuff. So of course, that's a game engine. There's is essentially a world builder platform, but the two complement each other. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. I will link one of the videos to just something that the demo team came up with that does exactly that, mixes the Unreal Engine with Spatial OS and comes up with something pretty cool. And graphically not too bad. So, especially in VR, it has the potential, if it works as advertised, to possibly, you know, a rebirth, a, a renaissance, if you will, of MMOs again, where the last little while they've gotten pretty stale and I know there's ones that hold out forever, EVE Online and... You know, there's, there's a lot of MMOs out there to choose from, a lot of premium ones, pay to play, etc. But we haven't really got anything in VR. And if this could one day lead to something in VR, I think that would be awesome to have and, and probably finally be the nail in that whole damn VR isn't social coffin, right? The final nail in that thing. So again, that's cloud-based development program from company Improbable called Spatial OS. They hit beta. All right, so the GDC wrap-up, probably the strongest week for virtual reality since last year's E3. A lot went down during this last week, starting with the interpretation of Vive's architecture by the company LG. It was refreshing to finally see somebody taking advantage of Vives or HTC's openness yeah, in terms. Now, are they completely open? Of course not. We've had that discussion. There's 
a lot more that can still be done. I'm personally throwing a lot of my optimism towards Kronos, for example, to truly have an open standard. But as far as backing what they've said, they've at least done that. And now LG basically gives us their version of Vive. <laughs> and the trackers, the controllers, I kind of actually like the controllers a little better with that uh, kind of fork skewer look. But... And they've got slightly higher resolution. So it's nice to see it expand beyond just HTC. And it gives us some insight, seeing this LG product, into exactly what HTC is trying to pull off. And remember, they've got their fingers in a lot of different broth pots. They are pursuing the whole virtual reality arcade and entertainment commercial side, plus the consumer side, Plus, they're trying to deploy a more open system architecture. We also saw this last week, Oculus slashing their prices pretty aggressively. And you know, as far as not even being a year old, $100 US off their HMD, another $100 US off their touch controller bundle, and then $20 off of their sensor. So... It, you know, if your only excuse for not wanting to jump in has been, you know, it's too cost prohibitive, depending on, of course, what you could budget for quite a few of those people, this now means they can purchase a unit. And let's not forget HTC Vive with their financing options. Now, personally, my recommendation would always be pay it with cash unless it's an absolute certainty you're going to have the money because that's how credit can kill you very quickly. But you know what? It's another avenue for somebody to have virtual reality ownership, you know, just by dropping that price point uh, on the HMD and the peripherals. Microsoft also made their presence felt rather than just being whiteboard, you know, flow charts and ideas. They had a concrete product there people were able to test it's still very rough the resolution isn't where it needs to be uh, there's a lot of technical factors that they have to nail down fix address before they're ready for their holiday launch now that's their game plan and i'm thinking that's probably overly optimistic because based on what they showed at gdc while there were some cool aspects to it they got a long way to go in a lot of different areas with not a lot of time to do it in and then probably the most powerful statement at the whole show, throughout the whole show, was wireless. The whole concept. And no company showed that off better probably than Qualcomm with their Snapdragon 835. Probably the one true all-in-one mobile VR solution by having the GPU, CPU, all of the processing actually in the HMD, they are really, truly, probably the one and only self-contained product. Now, granted, they're just a bit above mobility in terms of performance. They don't approach desktop performance. But it's a start that, who knows, five to ten years from now, what that will lead to. I kind of see them going that way. Unless the wireless can pick up a lot of the slack, which is going to get difficult, increasingly difficult as the resolution goes up. It's going to have to Moore's Law right along with the resolution. And I'm not so sure wireless is going to be able to do that. I can see them pulling off 1080p, maybe even 1440, but 4K and above is going to be tough. Not impossible, but tough. So having a CPU on board rather than having to wireless to it or tether to it, that is an advantage in that design. All right, then the last thing I want to talk about is AMD's Ryzen. Kind of been avoiding this, and I did that for a reason. A, I wanted to have an understanding of the impact of the Ryzen on virtual reality. First and foremost, that would be the reason on this channel for me to talk about it. Now, was I excited? Absolutely. I was one of those guys who had an AMD Athlon 64 back when they could truly wipe the floor with Intel. Since that processor, I've only been Intel. AMD has consistently not impressed me. Yes, they had some bang for the buck, 
but, and I don't mean this in a snobby, arrogant way, I've been a high-end gamer since then. The bang for the buck wasn't as important to me as power. <laughs> I wanted power uh, to go along with a fast GPU, for example. And that's only in those years since where I was able to actually do that, right? But the other reason was they had one benchmark. And I kept telling that to people that would ask, not you guys so much, but you know, people in the tech world, in my real life tech job, you know, what do you think about Ryzen? Aren't those benchmarks impressive? I said, you mean the Cinebench benchmarks? Because that's all we've seen. And indeed, that was all we did see was Cinebench, which does not paint even a bit of a full picture. It's one benchmark. And now, in hindsight, we know it was their best performance gap, which is probably the reason they showed that off. Where they're a little disappointing is on the status quo gaming front. Let me explain. Gaming at 1080p, and there's a whole bunch of links I'm going to include here, up against five-year-old Intel systems. They were losing 1080p gaming benchmarks 20 to 40% which is huge, that is huge. Yes, there were some exceptions to that. Ashes of the Singularity is a very AMD friendly game. Yes, there's still a lot of room for optimization and that's how I'm gonna end this, but I'll mention it right now just as a, as a quick pre to that. If you look at PC World's benchmarking as well, so I mentioned the five-year-old Ivy Bridge that wiped the floor with it. There were a lot of other games. And it's only as you scale up where the GPU becomes more important that it's able to go neck and neck. But when it's purely CPU, they're not doing too well, the Ryzen. And that bang for the buck argument quickly disappears. So that kind of gets to my recommendation so far. And the main overriding recommendation would be wait a few more months. Let AMD come out with some optimizations. It's going to happen. There's going to be updates that's going to better take advantage of the features that it has. Does that mean they're automatically going to win those benchmarks they lost? Probably not. But it might close the gap substantially. That's what happens when chipsets, CPUs, GPU drivers mature. So if you're an AMD enthusiast, right? Big fan of AMD or simply more than just a PC gamer, I would suggest waiting at least until spring, by which time those optimizations should have started rolling out. If you're a PC gamer who does a lot more, also wait. If you're a PC gamer with a massively large library, and that's pretty much all you do, a ton of your games are 1080p, there's absolutely no reason for you to upgrade at all to a Ryzen. If you're a PC gamer at 4K, then absolutely Ryzen is going to, you know, give you benefit of that bang for the buck, but you better have the GPU to match. So uh, impressive, nice to see them finally have a CPU after the bulldozer fiasco worth talking about. At least we're having the discussion and I want that company to do well, but I'm in no rush to sell my i7, I'll tell you that especially for VR. All right, guys, that is it for the news. Hopefully another gaming video. That's, that's my plan for the weekend. As always, guys, cheers.